Hello, welcome to the Cube Pod, episode fourteen. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. This is our podcast. We look at all the stuff we're talking about every week. Our events we're going to, top trends, what's in the news, what we're analyzing, and the new data that we're getting that doesn't hit the presses yet. We talk about it. It'll probably hit SiliconAngle.com later in the week or weekend or next week. We take a look at what's happened, then we look at what's happening now and what's going to happen next week. This is with the Cube Pod. Dave, great to see you. Episode fourteen. We said let's get the twenty episodes. See how it goes. Great to see Big you. Week. I'm here in your home turf in Boston. Yeah, I'm glad to see you again. It was <laughs> awesome. You stayed after Red Hat Summit. Um, um, I came in from Vegas. It's been a good week. Mongo. I mean, we got to talk about that. Mongo DB. I don't want to pop the stock. Nvidia almost. Stock was up hit 80 it. points today. Eight zero. <laughs> Eight zero. Insane, no? Eighty-two points. Twenty-eight percent. Wow, it shows the benefit of being conservative. Well, I think I think they probably tightened the expense belt to get the numbers, but they they are the the bellwether and the proxy for developers because MongoDB database also uses a lot of cloud compute, a lot of EC2 as we know. So, you know, if Mongo's doing well, that's a that's the canary in the coal mine that the developers are continuing to drive the innovation cycle. And that's going to be very interesting to see. The jobs numbers are out. NVIDIA hit a trillion dollar valuation. We did that last week. We, we did the breaking analysis on it. Uh, I think we were the first ones to, to report on that. But like I said, it's just going to increase more opportunity, barriers to entry. AMD wants a piece of the action. I just interviewed Matt Garman at uh, top executive at AWS who ran compute, knows that Silicon game really well. So he's pumping up their GPUs. I mean, Nvidia AI is happening again, more AI. Broadcom popping after, after hours, their stocks up. VMware trading at a discount. Mongo popped, Zscale is showing acceleration. Dell beat, but they had their worst numbers in three straight numbers in history yeah, of PC they, sales. They, they declined, but they beat, right? HP is soft, H, HPQ, Supermicro was soft, HPE cited softness for service. Broadcom was really interesting because after hours, it was all over the place. The company hit its numbers and then Hock Tan gave some AI chip guidance, basically said last year yeah. it was 10% of their business, and 15%, it's going to be a 25% of their business. And people were like, oh, at first they yeah. said that's going to detract from the existing business. So they yeah. sold the stock in pre-market. And then afterwards people were like, kind of got a reality check and said, no, no, that's a good thing. And then the stock went up today. So it was, people are just confused. So of course, Charles Fitzgerald, Fitzy, who we love, always puts out great tweets. This is his tweet. Dell, quote, servers and networking, unquote, revenue down 24%, parentheses, down more than their PC client business. But, 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 cloud re repatriation. Smiley face, laughing, crying, smiling. I wrote, where are the repatriates? And he wrote, not buying their hardware at Dell, it seems. Dell numbers were down. What's the repatriation look like? I mean, does that have anything to do with repatriation? You cover Dell. Is their business down because no one's repatriating or is it cyclical? What's your take? Well, I mean, this, this, the business sucks right now. I mean, servers and storage are soft. Right. I mean, that's really the, the bottom line is that people, I think what happened, John, is people came out of the pandemic and they bought servers and storage to replenish and networking to replenish the, the uh, headquarters. Now, Cisco was interesting last month because Cisco was chewing through its supply chain. So it had unbelievable, it had great growth, like top line growth at 12%, but that was because it was chewing through, its, uh, chewing through its backlog. And then it guided really conservatively. So, you know, it's really, really mixed right now. I, I, it's no longer a supply problem. I mean, Dell can get servers, they can build servers. Storage being done, pure storage did okay. NetApp did okay, but not great. I mean, storage is not a great business right now. So it's soft. And I think that's, again, what happened is replenishing the HQ and now people are taking a pause because you know, they yeah. don't know what's going to happen. There's a lot of uncertainty out there. It's, it's, a, it's a weird time of the year, right? It's everyone's graduated from high school, middle school, college. I see a lot of graduations on Facebook and in social networks. Um, it's summertime, pre-summer. June's going to be a big month for theCUBE. We got massive events going on. We got Cisco Live, HPE Discover, Snowflake Summit, Databricks event, which is data plus AI. We got uh, uh, AWS Reinforced, which is their security show. Um, I just think that there's so much going on around AI. Everything's an AI show now. So it's, it's really a weird time. The, the public's afraid of AI. And again, more news about banning AI. So there seems to be the, the two schools of thought going on right now about AI, you know, anti-AI and then pro-AI. So, you know, I, I find that really fascinating that there's actually the emotional response 
of AI in to the to the world right now. So like, it's just a very weird time. Well, Dell was interesting last week. So Dell had this announcement of Project Helix where they did a deal with um, NVIDIA. And it wasn't the first announcement that they made, but it was, it was up there, it was prominent. Other people were saying, geez, they kind of buried the lead. At the, at the same time, you saw Red Hat, <laughs> right? Red Hat, right, with, with, with Ansible, it was all about AI, and that was pretty prominent. Yeah. I don't know, were people accusing them of AI washing? Not really. Not really, right? Not so really. it was, it was it seemed deemed as very positive. And then it was, we just had you know, Zias Caravalla in here prepping for uh, Cisco Live, and he's thinking, well, they're not going to do a big, huge AI, and that's what just big AI is going to be everywhere. You know, so they're not yeah. going to try to hook uh, hook their wagon up to, to AI. It's very confusing right now. I, th I think AI is going to actually expose our super cloud narrative is to be true. I think, I think you know, I mean, basically my feed is like, AI is going to kill us. And then the next set of this, how to integrate into your life. <laughs> <laughs> so infusing with AI and then it's going to kill you. Oh, super but, cloud. But you know, I, I think AI, I course. think AI is one of those things that's horizontal. It's going to be an all developers toolkit. Uh, software developers are going to use it, and I think it's going to get abstracted away. As John Chambers said, voice activated, you know, auto coding, humans will be involved, but it will be a developer software thing. And I think that's going to be where the value is. It's going to be embedded in all apps. And the question is, how does an entrepreneur, how does that next Airbnb, that next Dropbox, these are companies that made their business successful because of Amazon and cloud. What's that next generation startup look like? get the product market fit really quick with AI or whatever. Then they got, what do they do next? What's the path? Or is open AI the, that startup? The, the, the path is, I don't think that's, I think they're more like the browser, not so the website. You think they're Netscape? I think they're the Netscape, but it's not the startup that invents something. So say this is a healthcare app or say something in public policy. If you're the startup, it was like the old way was get product market fit, sell it, scale it, get, get go to market. Now what do you do? You got to get, into the cloud, do like a snowflake did, get on top of the CapEx, be a super cloud app or a super app, and then double down on everything, right? Get the success and scale it. I think the old way of getting press releases and doing like startups is over. Well, I do think that, that the, as we talked about, incumbents are going to benefit from AI if they can apply it. And there's going to be some company that comes out of the woodworks with some new business model like keyword search that people will poo-poo at first. The VCs will say, oh, that's a stupid idea. And then they'll come through the side door and blow people away. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's how it's going to go. I mean, OpenAI is interesting, right? I mean, it's really, you know, you use ChatGPT. I do too. We use Bard. And it's, you know, when you dig into it it's, and, you, and you research it, it's about predicting the next word and taking the internet and the human condition and figuring out, okay, how I can write sentences. But I think the next step there is going to be, everybody talks about guardrails. You, you, you and I had a conversation. I'm like, hey, what does that even mean? I actually think it means to train the system to when it doesn't know, to not hallucinate, and to ask questions back of the prompter when they don't <laughs> know, right? So what do you mean by this? Or what do you mean by that? Or I don't know what that means, or I don't have the answer, as opposed to like Jason Calcana started the cube with Dave Vellante. I mean, that's like, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's all, it's all this misinformation at that point. I mean, yeah. technically, but data is the control point. I mean, you have your own proprietary data, you put it in. I mean, if you're a startup, what do you do? But seriously, you get product market fit, what happens next? Well, you go sell, right? I mean, that's... <laughs> yeah, where? <laughs> like hire salespeople? Go to the marketplace. Well, that's a good question. I mean, what happens to the BDR? Look, look at data dog. No, no, seriously, what happens to the BDR? Does the BDR get disintermediated by AI? I mean, this is a big conversation. In the I think, network I think AI that. will change the, the lead generation, demand gen cycle. I think if you look at what Amazon's doing, Azure's doing, and Google, they all have marketplaces. If you have software and you're a software app, you want to be in these marketplaces because they have sales right there. They're in, embedding in contracts. You're part of the feature of the next thing. Or if you want to be monolithic or old school, you go standalone, you raise a bunch of VC money, and then you hire an army of salespeople and BDRs and inside salespeople, and you go. Is that, that was the fast way. Right, but so. No, is it now the slow way? What'd the BDR do? The, the BDR, he or she would send out emails, who troll LinkedIn, send out emails, right? Well-written emails, and then follow up. I mean, 
how much of that can AI do? Not zero. I think, I think <laughs> human plus AI is better than AI, as we've been saying. I agree. So I, agree. I would look at that as the more productive. I think the BDRs might be the new reps. But let's say, oh, interesting. But so, okay, so let's say you were going to hire 10 BDRs, mm -hmm. right, over the course of a year. And now you got AI and you're actually using AI well and you know how to prompt AI and you can write good, you know, intro letters and you can, you know, have software that trolls, you know, LinkedIn. How many BDRs are you going to need? Five? It could be a new dynamic. One, remember the 10 What's your guess? You think you cut it in half? Yeah, definitely. Easily. Easily. I mean, what percent of your time when you're doing mundane tasks does ChatGPT save you? A lot. I would say it cuts mine down at 40%. Yeah. Maybe. I it's can a do productivity it. opportunity if you're editing. Well, that's not our, relying on it. Well, in our, right. Well, in our world, that's we do a lot of editing, right? Like especially with transcripts. You take the transcripts that we have, and you know that are auto-generated, right? It just makes you more productive. So well, that's easy, though, right? That's an out. We're going to look back and say, okay, this is like we always joke about it. This is like dial-up. You know, <laughs> uh, CC mail, right? <laughs> So news happening, Amazon workers walk out amid layoffs citing concerns for climate. Basically three days, a, they ask them to come back for three days a week and they're all walking out. Because of climate? I don't know, I don't know. No, no, they're coming back to the office. Right. So they're revolting. They're revolting because they need to come back to the office or they're revolting because it's bad for the environment to commute? Well, the concerns about rising carbon emissions, office policies, all that above. And I, you know, Amazon's going to be carbon neutral. They had a, they have a target date that's in, in visibility. So I think it's just a red herring of people are afraid of AI taking their jobs and then coming back to the office. I think people want to work at home. Yeah, I think that's really more the issue. I mean, I, I, do you buy that it's sort of cl climate change that's the issue or is it they just don't want to go back to the office? I don't know, I didn't read the article. That's <laughs> the walkout is the collaboration between the Amazon employees for climate justice. First of all, justice is in the word. That's, that's definitely an interesting term. <laughs> that's, that's scary. Amazon employees for climate justice and an informal group of employees who oppose Amazon's mandated return to the office. Employees say recent layoffs and the mandate, which increases admissions as workers commute, have left them questioning whether Amazon executives are leading the company in the right. That is so laughable that I have to drive now. I'm going to be polluting the environment because my car's on the road. Do these people eat some hamburgers? Amazon. <laughs> do they understand that large language models can take up most carbon and Amazon actually has carbon neutral footprint and that's actually good? Amazon employees for climate justice. When you see that, when you hear that word, what, do you, what jumps into your head? Amazon employees for climate justice. I big red flag to me and it's like I don't I think they just want to work at home a group of people having beers at home just saying hey you know let's have some climate justice you think they're shooting the breeze <laughs> having group oh, meetings this hurts do we have to talk about this anymore <laughs> I'll say that in my rant section but I wanted to bring that up <laughs> it'll definitely be in my rant section but you know the, the big issue is is AI is the AI and the GPUs that's the real I mean meaty story right now is GPUs are are tight um, Nvidia stock is up you and I were talking before we came in and, and yesterday that, you know, they got a hold on the GPUs. Yeah, well, I mean, you got NVIDIA making GPUs, you got AMD's making GPUs and they're gonna come out with a new line. You got Intel actually making GPUs, but you know, like that one practitioner told us, they're subpar, but we use them anyway because we need competition to NVIDIA who's gouging us. But I mean, you can't blame Jensen for gouging because they can't make enough of them. So it's supply and demand. Why? Yeah. yeah, they're going to take that, but but they, they are, they do run hot. It was interesting at Dell Tech World, John, you've been to numerous Dell Tech Worlds and EMC Worlds. When you look at the ecosystem at Dell Tech World, you know, there were a lot of companies doing like cooling tech, like liquid cooling. We had some on the cube. It was actually quite amazing. It's back. It's like, remember the old mainframes with the thermal <laughs> conduction modules? They had like, you know, pipes and they were pumping in, you know, cold liquid. So that's back because you got to cool these things down. The energy is a huge issue here. I mean, it's consuming a lot of energy and, you know, you saw Bitcoin was, was mining, was criticized, but, you know, I mean, you got to just focus on creating alternative forms of energy and that's what these big companies are doing. And so you're not going to stop progress. It's just going to keep beating, whether it's coal or nuclear or solar or wind into the, into the system, it's, it's going to use energy. And so, <laughs> 
I don't see that as being a, 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 a blocker. I see it's something that the industry is going to have to deal with. Okay, some news going on in SiliconANGLE.com. Of course, all that it's hitting. Cisco buys armor blocks to beef up cybersecurity generative AI. So Cisco Live's coming up. Uh, again, this is an AI story. Will it be in there? It's security. Blink Copilot shows how generative AI can supercharge cloud security operations. A first story from one of our new writers, freelancer Tim Keary. C coming on, on Cisco? Yeah. Cisco, Cisco, you know, Cisco, yeah. hired, hired Tom Gillis to work for G2 to run their security business. And I think, I, I think what they need to do is to build a security super cloud. I do. I think they've got a they've got an opportunity to simplify ac across the, across clouds and on prem and create a common user experience, and they're in as good a position as anybody to do it. You know Cisco better than yeah. I do. They got good engineering, and if they really put their resources on it, well, they the right. engineering company. Well, right? the networking is really the important part right now. If you look at multi cloud where that's going, I think I've always said Cisco is perfectly poised for multi cloud. They are super poised for as we define super cloud, which is the fabric between policies and tying that with software defined networking and software defined data center for software defined cloud or cloud operations. If you look at Red Hat Summit, for instance, we were there, um, it was incredible. If you look at the open source software uh, work they're doing uh, as well in the open community, networking is prime for innovation with cloud operations, with edge latencies involved. So you're going to see more and more networking action going on, both in the large cloud operations and on premises and edge. It's just, it's a, it's a dream scenario for Cisco because with all the AI coming on board, there's going to be more need for the East apps with low latency data uh, transfer. So, you know, I think there could be a, a, a generational kind of renaissance for Cisco. Let me ask you a question, because we've had Steve Mullaney on a bunch of times from mm -hmm. Aviatrix. He talks about the, you know, the networking super cloud and sort of, you know, he knows Cisco obviously mm -hmm. very well. You know Cisco. Um, is what he says, you know, he, he implies that Cisco is, you know, the old guard, he kind of uses the anti jassy depositioning. Yeah. But I'm inferring from what you just said that Cisco is actually in a good position to build the networking super cloud, because they got the install base and they got, yeah. if they can get their technology. If, if you look at Microsoft, when Microsoft, you and I were, I remember when you and I had a chat, like, hey, I can't believe Microsoft's at 26 bucks a share. <laughs> what are they at now? 400, whatever yeah. the number is. I checked the number, it's huge. 2.4 trillion. Their turnaround is, is, is to me the exact play that Cisco will will and should should and will do most likely in my opinion. I don't know. I haven't talked to Chuck Roberts about it, but if I'm the CEO advisor there, um, I would basically be advising him heavily to t double down on their core enterprise install base, bring value immediately with cloud to that to the customers, and nail multi cloud in a way that is so epic that their customers won't even consider switching costs. So when you and I met, Microsoft was twenty six, twenty seven dollars a share. And, and then it you know peaked at whatever four hundred or something. And yeah, now it's still now it's look what look what happened. You know, bye bye Balmer, bye bye proprietary, open brace Linux, open sourced, uh, open compute. They started open compute. They started doing a lot more open open stuff. They took their scale from MSN, made that their base cloud, and you know changed the airplane out at thirty four thousand feet, as we say, and brought in cloud and they whitewashed everything as 365, which we always were, were, were critical of, but that was a step in the right direction. I mean, they, they were, they're constantly upgrading and pedaling as fast as they can to get to Amazon Web Services. Um, and the difference between AWS and Microsoft is Microsoft has huge install base and generations of serving enterprise customers. And enterprise customers sometimes just want the, the numbness of their, what's com what they're comfortable with. And so as a new trend comes in, if Microsoft can deliver good enough, then that's going to put pressure on Amazon Web Services to have a, a more compelling value proposition to handle the switching costs, which is uncomfortable, or is price the issue? So I think Amazon has done an amazing job of being first with the cloud to be the swipe the credit card shadow IT, and then workloads in the cloud are, are amazing. So yeah, clearly Amazon's number one. They're not, slow, they're not hurting, but Azure has the install base. So it's a race. It's a race for how fast can AWS take territory on Microsoft's customers and how Microsoft can hold the dam from breaking and keep the customers there. And that's the game that's going on right now. And you know, we've got the history with Microsoft and AWS and the years in the industry. That's what's happening. 
I go back to And the, you can squint through all the PR that Frank Shaw's doing and like all the pomp and circus. Oh, open AI, which is a $10 million, you know, marketing campaign to make Bing look like they have AI. So, you know, it's, that's, that's not real AI from Microsoft. That's just a great move, which by the way, I love that move. I'm just saying, that's not I, what Amazon does. I, I go back to you, Jerry Chen and I, I think the first reInvent we ever did on theCUBE, we had Jerry Chen on and we were talking about, you know, do you think Amazon's ever going to go up the stack? And Jerry, I think nailed it. And, and you did too, we basically said, look, Amazon's play is to provide tools so that companies, builders can compete with the SaaS players not necessarily build their own SaaS. Now they will do that in certain you know, examples like they do with yeah. you know, Connect and Call Center and things like that, but their strategy is not to mimic what Microsoft is doing or what Google's doing with Workspace. Um, their strategy is to allow their ecosystem and partners and customers to actually build those. And so the reason I bring that up is because I think when you think about generative AI, that's the sort of similar approach that they're taking, right? It's I mean, not... Amazon, Amazon and Microsoft, mainly Amazon, because they have the most cloud customers, serves virtually every kind of company and industry. From startups, they've evolved to be that big. And so when you look at an enterprise versus say an ISV, there's different use cases of consumption. So Amazon Web Services has that problem where every time, and probably internally, I can imagine the internal dynamics where there's an opportunity there, there's an opportunity there. This, everything's an opportunity because they're, they're leading. They got to figure out how to do both. They got to provide SaaS products to enterprises that want turnkey, and they got to provide the building blocks to builders, right? And they have everything up and down the stack. And I think the work they're doing, the silicon I've always said has always been the most important, the physics. So, you know, uh, Adrian Cockcroft, he's come on, came on the cube last year and he said, you want to block the Legos, build your own and make it hardened, good platforms, a lot of work, or do you want to have the toy that's pre-built for you, the Legos that are pre-built? But if it breaks, you got to throw the Lego away and get a new one. <laughs> so, so you build your own, make it tight, or you just get one. And that's when it breaks. Well, what's his point? Is that Amazon's doing both or that Microsoft? No, no, Microsoft, is, is, no is, is Amazon the, has both. The, Microsoft is the ultimate Lego prefabricated service, their software company. So they're used to serving, you know, prefabricated software, general purpose software to companies. So what that means is the building blocks allows a team saying, I want a real platform in cloud. I'm going to build it and it's going to cost more, take more time, but you can always fix it. That's, you, that's Amazon. That's Amazon. Yeah, right, but that, well, but they, now the higher level services that we covered last year is a lot more, okay, I got the house ready to go. It's already built. If it breaks, yeah, it's still not SaaS, right? I mean, it's still not like. I mean, it, I guess it is up to the data level. Well, right now but you it's, got. It's if not, you want to use Code Whisperer, that's a SaaS product. Yeah. yeah okay. Sorry. What I mean is, it's it's not like productivity software. You know, they're not doing Office, right? Well, exactly. They're but, not doing Google Docs. Yeah, but they they can make software like Call Center. Right? It's like that's what I was saying. I mean, like Certain verticals where it makes sense for them to, to build solutions, they will. But you think they're going to they're gonna start mimicking Microsoft's software portfolio? I think that would be a mistake, actually. Well, that's what they announced at reInvent. I think that's going to be the challenge. Wait, wait, what, what do you mean? What did they announce at reInvent? Well, Adam Slesky, when we did the exclusive interview, he was essentially saying, look it, we're going to be moving up the stack and providing higher level services. That's code words for things like Connect and- But he couched it as very industry specific. Yes. Right, which makes a lot of sense to me. You know, you're going to, what you want to do is identify industries that are ripe for disruption, that are very unproductive or, you know, have a lot of waste yeah. and then reinvent them. I mean, that's kind of what like they do. Like be Bedrock is like AI, open AI. That's a service that runs on but AWS. It, yeah, it's, 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 right. It's, it's a managed service. Yeah. Right. Okay. But build, it, it's, it's got building blocks. You can take first party models, build with third party models. But they also integrate. Versus say, say, Code Whisperer, which is helping a developer, that's a solution from Amazon. That's a SaaS service. But they also will integrate with third parties. Yep. So you can use Hugging Face, for example, or other generative AI. I asked, I asked Matt Garman directly today in my interview with him, which will be published next week, and um, is, do you want to be offering open AI on Bedrock? He said, we, wanna op we want to offer every model available on AWS. Yeah, why wouldn't they? But, but do you think Microsoft's going to allow that? Well, Microsoft doesn't own OpenAI. They only did a $10 million deal with them. According to some people, they basically do that, that. By virtue of that $10 billion, they essentially control them. 
Well, every customer that I talk to on the privately on the, before I come on Cubes or a CISO or CIO, and the insiders of the VCs all say they want open. They want, want open AI. And remember, Andy Jess used to tell us that Windows workloads was one of the most popular workloads on AWS at, uh, at, at some Remember, point. iPhone came out, you could only get it on AT&T, right? Mm -hmm. Right, so maybe it's like that. Maybe for you know for a while. Maybe that's I don't know if that's part of the deal that Microsoft struck yeah. with Open AI. Is mm -hmm. I mean I think the big clouds like Amazon are going to look at the generative AI apps and look at how they can differentiate on privacy and IP. Because remember the, the whole whole thing about if you put stuff into into Open AI or ChatGPT, it becomes part of their corpus. Right. Well, so you got IP leakage yep. that you're concerned about. Also. You know, cost, we were joking about repatriates, but but costs are a factor too. I mean, if you're running supercomputers with, you know, half a million cores, are you going to run that in the cloud? I mean, I, no, honest, honest question, are you going to? Is it cost effective to run a half a million cores in the cloud? Depends. I don't know, are I they think it's probably a crossover. If they're, if they're at a steady state, maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. I mean, some, one entrepreneur. I would say maybe no. Well, then you just you don't have to over provision. Over provisioning was the big problem with data center capacity planning, the the the, the Black Monday, you know, Friday surge. But but you know these large language models are running essentially on supercomputers, right? Yeah. And some of these supercomputers are massive, like physically massive. So if I'm a university, right, or a national lab, and I've got a supercomputer, I want to show it off so I can raise money. <laughs> Right? Come on in, look mm -hmm. at my supercomputer. <laughs> <laughs> look at the lights flashing. Right, so, oh, yeah. you know, you can't do that in the cloud. So, I mean, Fitzy's right. The cloud growth still significantly outpacing that of on-prem. He's, he's right about that. I mean, But he, I think he, there's, it's going to be interesting to see where these models actually run. Open AI is running a lot of its training in Ohio in supercomputers. So here's a story, ChatGPT wins over doctors in answering medical questions. A study published in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, compared two sets of written responses to real world patient questions. One set written by physicians, the other by ChatGPT. Panel preferred ChatGPT 79% of the time. Is it a blind study? <laughs> it had to be, right? <laughs> well, we, we've asked many times in theCUBE over the last several years, when is it that AI will make better diagnoses than doctors. And I remember we were interviewing that guy at, from KPMG at IBM Think, and he's like, it's already there. I don't know if it was or not, but it's getting close. What do you, well, I mean, I think it, you've always said it, you know, ChatGPT will make a great talent greater and a mediocre talent great. And so it's all a function of the human. And this is one of the things we've been covering is that the humans plus AI is better than AI. Constantly the case. All right, Dave. Well, we got a lot of gigs going on. What else is on, that you're covering? What, what's, on, what's on your radar? I got Cisco Live coming up. We'll be there, me and you. It's the pop-up cube. We got the new pop-up cube. Yeah, so Cisco Live, I'm excited about it, right? I think it would be interesting to see what we're going to see next week. Again, I think Cisco's got an opportunity to simplify. The, the problem that Cisco has is so complex. I mean, you know this. Uh, and so they've got to simplify the portfolio so they can keep growing. Salespeople have a hard time sort of absorbing all that. And um, and then, yeah, in June, we're on the road every week. We got Reinforce. You know, I don't I'm know home, what that's going to be like. I'm home for four days this month. <laughs> anyway, we have a lot of, we have super cloud. I don't think I can remember too. the a more crowded cube month in 13 years. No, but the two months of May and June I've seen is more crowded. But, but as far as a single month, everybody's trying to get stuff in before yeah. the quarter ends. Every week is we got something going on. And um, we're doing a lot of work with George Gilbert around looking at the future of data and data platforms and Snowflake and what, you know, just in prep for the Snowflake Summit. I'm excited to see what they're going to be announcing. Um, we're doing Mongo. I mean, Mongo, like the hottest stock on the planet right now, which is kind of awesome to see. I like those guys. Let's unpack that, Mongo. We, we're going to be at their event this year. Um, they've been kind of bunkered in. I felt like they've been kind of retooling, keeping their expenses tight. You know, you would have thought that the, the Atlas stuff, which is their managed cloud service, was what drove the, the quarter, but it was really a combination of conservatism. They had, a, they had decent traditional license growth, like really good actually, and good expense control. And so I think it's just, 
I think a lot of companies, I mean, even Snowflake has struggled with its, with its visibility and its, and its guide. And so, and Snowflake's notoriously conservative and Scarpelli's really good at it. I think, I think Mongo was so ultra conservative and they blew that away. I guess the same with NVIDIA, although I feel like NVIDIA was just, maybe not just ultra conservative. I think they might've been caught off guard. They, they beat by, you know, $600 million. I mean, that's just a massive beat. So it's very uncertain right now, John. I've never seen a time when visibility was this uncertain. I've seen times where visibility is really bad. I remember Ed Zander yeah. during the, after the dot-com bubble said, does anybody want to buy a server? There was, nobody had any, any you know, inkling that there was going to be sales. So everybody knew. They had, they had good visibility that, that the market was terrible. Right? <laughs> Today, it's like some people say, no, actually, we got pretty good, good demand. Right? We're going to beat and raise service now. Yeah, hey, no, demand's really good. Others, you know, Dell's being super conservative. The, 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 the repatriates are being very conservative right now. Software's mixed, right? Software's yeah. really mixed right now. Yeah, and I think you had a good um, breaking analysis on this where you looked at where people are, are they holding because of the uh, spend? Are they pausing? Are they shifting? Uh, I think a lot of companies saw the, the headwinds and said, let's bunker in. Even the big companies like Mongo, but they, you can't stop progress and the AI wave is creating more action on the developer front than ever before. We were reported, you and I reported, and I was at the KubeCon and then Open Source Summit. In the past month and a half, the open source models, the lightweight third party long tail models have been booming with growth. Innovation, new projects, lightweight stuff too, not heavy models. So like you're going to see this long tail power law, the prominent uh, models that the big guys have first party and you have third party. So Amazon's got, you know, first party models like um, Anthropopic and they have then the third party through this bedrock application, which is their version of OpenAI. OpenAI is doing the same thing. You've got ChatGPT, which is their primary uh, pr predominant model. But then you're going to have a long tail of models and like you put up, who's, how do you make put that together? So I think we're going to see, remember the web 2.0 mashups, you know, yeah. API maps. You know, overlay. Sure. You talk about Uber all the mash time. Mashup camp. Remember those guys? David <laughs> yeah. Berlin. David Doug, Berlin. Doug Gold. Yeah, mashup, <laughs> mashing up. I think you're going to see same exact thing happen with AI. You're going to see the confluence of the prominent third parties on the big clouds and then a long tail of open source. And it's going to be a developer dream to mash these up. And you'll see startups come out of the woodwork. It'll be interesting to see if the big guys will enable it, whether Amazon will enable their the tried and true fashion of putting apps at the top of the stack and not competing and somewhat friendly competing on the big stuff. Microsoft wants to own everything. So the question is, what's the better play? Cool. Uh, and some say it's the Apple versus the and Android. iPhone's doing great, proprietary, but, well, you know. You know, in periods that we've seen a lot of these disruptions and what often happens is, you know, the new stuff, the, the existing incumbents it's relatively small in the grand scheme of their, you know, multi, multi tens of billions of dollars of business. So they can't pivot fast enough or take advantage of fast enough to move the needle. You got certain players that actually like Nvidia in this case, like Cisco back in the IP days, you know, Cisco mm -hmm. still hasn't achieved its, its, its um, peak, gone back, gotten back to its peak valuation of, of 2000. Remember Cisco was, I think at one point, the most valuable company on the planet. Right, and so what you typically see is in the early days of this disruption, a select group of companies really can take advantage or is perceived to be taking advantage and the stocks go crazy. The incumbents are trying to figure out, okay, how do we take advantage? And that always takes more time for them to reach an equilibrium. But explain this one. The, the, the Dow was up two, two, over 2% 2 today. So, the, so the, the big thing was jobs report, right? Jobs report came in hot. So people are thinking, okay, you would think, oh, well, that means the Fed's going to raise rates. Okay, but the market loved the fact that, oh, maybe we're not in a recession. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so S&P was up, the NASDAQ was up, tech was up, you know. So I think, I think the market's really confused. People, and then watch Monday, they'll realize, oh, wow, that means the Fed's going to raise rates again, and then the market will go down. Yeah. So it's, it's very hard to predict right now, and I think, I, I do know this, I think you and I both agree, this AI wave is real. 
and the people that figure out how to apply it to their business to cut their costs and maybe come up with new business models are going to thrive. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an entrepreneurial dream scenario. If you're a startup and you're an entrepreneur, everything you're reading online is going to be outdated. <laughs> you're going to see new playbooks emerge. I think it's a lot like the web. There'll be a bubble. We're seeing it now. And the question is, because it's so software embedded with AI and it's so horizontally scalable in every vertical, what's going to be the playbook once they get the code, the product market fit? What happens next? Because there's a huge chasm that hasn't been there before. Before you'd have to go through at least an accelerated compared to the old model. The old model was you get a PowerPoint, show a VC, they give you some seed money, you buy a bunch of servers, put it under your desk, put one in a data center or build your own and then you code away, six months later you get a prototype, you get another round of funding, and then the web came on with the cloud, they're like, code a prototype, get some customers, show some traction, get some VC money, upgrade the product, reduce the technical debt, hire a go-to-market team, get customers and run as hard as you can. That was the fast way, now it's faster. The question is, you get the product, you, you put models together, you jump in open source, you grab essentially open source software, which would have taken you years to develop, man years. Another man, bunch of man years over here, you just like chunk it up and you're like, and you have a code. And then you get, if you get customers, then you can just put it in the cloud and the cloud scale kicks in. That's why the super cloud narrative is really relevant because you can then leverage all the CapEx of the cloud providers to get scale. And once you're there, the money just falls out of the sky because you just skip like A and B rounds, you go right to the C round, growth round. So I just think it's going to be a massively new accelerated new venture creation trajectory. It's going to be something we've never seen before on that product market fit, highly accelerated, almost anti-hockey stick. It's just straight up. There's no, there's no curve. It's just straight up. In terms of actual adoption, you're saying? Yeah, if you hit, if you hit this wave hard, you're, go you're gone, you're good. You, might, you're, you just don't hold on, hold on to the rocket ship, right? So, so it's like, don't fall off. So, the only way to, and that's the key. And again, the cloud is so successful. You know, you get something on Amazon that hits and if it goes into the marketplace, you just accelerate it three years ago to market in a month. So, I mean, that's just a whole nother more, power it, dynamic. It, it's so, definitely more internet-like than it is, you know, the PC. The internet, remember the, the, the buzzword was paradigm shift. I mean, yeah. for years after the dot-com boom, we didn't mm -hmm. even use that term because yeah. people were like, oh, but it really was a business model shift. It was like, you know, atom-based businesses getting totally disrupted, yeah. you know, uh, um, sorry, yeah, bit-based business getting totally disrupted. Atom bit businesses sort of unclear, yeah. but they got disrupted too. This seems to me AI it just applies everywhere, right? I mean, you can apply it to make your infrastructure run better. You can apply it to reduce yeah. your headcount. You can apply it to create new products faster, as you were just yeah. saying. Yeah. I mean, there's just like an infinite number of use cases. If I was a VC AI. right now, I'd have my own scale lab, basically. Because well, remember that when the old days of software, you get software, you put on a shrink wrap package, you put it on shelves, people would buy it. For the folks under the age of 40 might not know this, but you have to buy software, load it on your machine. They didn't know if it, it was successful until they had, well, we didn't sell all the inventory. Then the internet came, you had SaaS, where you had SaaS analytics, CAC and acquisition, long-term value of the customer, all those KPIs and all the SaaS gurus yeah. defining success, land, adopt, expand, you know? You had metrics and that took some time to squint through the numbers, but you started to know if it was successful if people used it, if right. you had recurring revenue. And you could see it right in front of you. And that, that would bake out over a time series horizon. Now it's like product market fit, boom, you know right away, bang. Well, much I mean, faster, Chat much GPT, faster. The, the most adopted app in the history of humankind. Yeah, right? I mean, it, has, it wasn't even close. And remember before that, some of the other apps that were successful like Instagram, boom, once it gets traction, it's all, I think, I think AI will have a Instagram, WhatsApp, Chat GPT like trajectory on adoption once it hits, because I think it's that compelling. So I think, you know, looking for startups that are going to come out of the woodwork for, for deal flow from a VC, you got to get in like really early because the early stage is where you can just really leapfrog everybody because that means that if, if you believe what I said is happening, that will then accelerate that whole A rounds controlled by the growth. So you think about, again, we like yeah. the students of history here, but you go back to when the PC came out. I remember actually when we were at AC, because we were very quantitative, we actually had to go to class to get trained on how to use Lotus. 
right? <laughs> we had a trainer and it was like, okay, we had weeks and weeks of training, slash, bio, retrieve, paint, copies, go, and, and it was like, this is how you do it. And we had to go deep. Okay, internet, what was the killer app in the internet? It was email. Yahoo. Right, email and search. Yeah. yeah. Right, you really didn't need. Yahoo was the killer app right out of the gate. Because it was not, it was a, it was a search engine yeah, that so was allowed you to click on something. So was email, not everybody yeah. had email, right? Yeah. Hotmail so came out, web-based so, email. You didn't really need training, right? So adoption I mean, took off. I mean, you had AOL, you had you know, AT&T, WorldNet, you had Hotmail. In fact, I interviewed um, at the Red Hat Summit, the guys at Microsoft now for like 25 years, he ran Hotmail. He, when it was a startup, he stayed with Microsoft after the acquisition, one of the most successful companies in mail. I still have my Hotmail account, by the way. Do you? Oh yeah, keep it. it's like a vinyl record. I'm going to keep, I have all my AOL, my AOL account. I, <laughs> I got my AOL. Hotmail account. It was, you know, you get an email from Hotmail. It's like, whoa, what is this? You yeah, know, chat rooms you know, were kind of Yeah, vinyl records are up now. The throwback is coming, Dave. You know, Hotmail you might got be the, the Mac in your office behind you, the original Mac. I had a lease, I had one of the first leases. I told you that. Um, yeah. Steve Jobs shipped it to us and nobody wanted to use it. I was enthralled by it. So I started playing with the, user interface. But I guess my point is that those killer apps were relatively narrow. Email, communication, okay, fine. And search, you can search for stuff. And that actually kind of came later. And then, but you think about generative AI, I mean, the use cases are insane, right? I mean, so you don't need training, obviously. You don't need any instructions. All you need is creativity, right? So, fastest adoption ever, what was it called? The, AI heard around the world. That's so great. <laughs> it was definitely fast. So the other thing I want to get your thoughts on is um, I'm looking at my um, LinkedIn and um, there was a meme going around that looked at the uh, news since 1920. And um, it shows that every single era, everybody was afraid of automation. So this whole AI automation thing is complete, you know, garbage in my mind. 1920s, oh my God, this get wash machines or whatever that instrument was at the time. Uh, and then through the 90s, everyone was always questioning automation and jobs. It just never happened. Jobs are going to, they go away, new ones create. So I think that's going to happen here. I think uh, ChatGPT and OpenAI and Amazon stuff, and as apps come in, will eliminate positions in favor of better questions from doctors that could be done by, by machine AI, but AI won't replace doctors. So, so doctors will get better with AI. So I the agree. question is... I agree, but I, I think... You're right that, that machines have always replaced humans. We've talked about this in the course of time, always. Um, but this is the first time ever that the machines are replacing humans or doing human tasks that are cognitive, right? We've never had that before. So I think that scares a lot of people. So then the question becomes, okay, will it create new jobs? I think, yes, it'll, it'll create new jobs. What kind of jobs? Not really sure yet, you know, chat GPT prompter. <laughs> right. Well, prompt engineering yeah. is just a signal that prompt you're, engineering. It's right. just a signal that you're prompting something. You're calling a procedure. You're essentially voice activating or text. But activating. is that going to be a title that emerges? Prompt engineer probably already has. No, right. I think it's called the job. Right. The, the, everyone's job will have some sort H, of H, some H, sort of prompt engineering. For component. example, I my interview this this afternoon with Matt Garman. I had a list of questions and I put it in the teleprompter and. Um, you know, I did the read, I had some just bullets, and you know how I like to do the teleprompter, I don't like to read the whole thing, just have right. a bullet, yeah. but it's a nice little sentence paragraph for the, all, the meat of the topics I want. And there's like five or six bullets, I had a couple extras in there. I cut and paste the whole thing, so put in the chat GPT, do a teaser, preview. It wrote the most kick-ass preview post, yeah. right. that if I just pasted the video, I wouldn't even have to write a blog post, it just nailed it, I didn't have to edit one word, because my little cryptic, text was feeding the AI because I was controlling the hallucination aspect of it. There was no hallucination. I just said, write this and it made it good. And if I put the video there, you'd read the text and everything in the text would be like me teasing out my questions with his answers in the video. That means I don't have to write it, send the video. More people will watch the video. I did that literally in 10 seconds. Yeah, and you got a great product out of it. So it productivity, are you kidding me? So why do we need you to do the interview? Because I wrote the questions. Okay, because because you were a good prompt engineer. I prompted the teleprompter, which prompted me, which then fed the transcript. Now, when I get the transcript, which is now online, because we have the cube video data lake in our 
generative cube AI software now. So what I'm going to do, what's going to happen now is that's going to spit out his answers. Then I take all his quotes and say, write me a story about this as, as this preview. I merge the two together and it writes like a New York Times style story. That's hours of content savings from productivity. I merge the preview. I got the video. I got the text. I merge them together. Now I got the preview promotion for the video. Then I merge my preview with his answers. And I say, write this together. And it just kills it. I love, I love chat. GPT. I mean, I'm going to start, should we start putting a byline John Furrier via chat GPT? I've put that in some of my posts where I've extensively used ChatGPT. I mean, on LinkedIn, whenever I use ChatGPT, I, mean, I just say via ChatGPT. I'm transparent about it. I don't I mean, care. Why not? I mean, why I, not? I think people should, in fact, I want to have a site on, on SiliconANGLE. Maybe this is a good idea or not. Maybe we can find the resources. Just a section on AI content. You mean AI written content? From our stuff, yeah. We, if we have all this ability to create more derivative works, why wouldn't we have an AI section? I'd be curious, actually. You anyway. don't mean the covering AI news. You're talking no, no, about, I'm talking about AI written content. As a user, a consumer, I might be curious. Find out. I love SiliconAngle.com. They have all the great new stories in enterprise tech, extracting the signal from the noise. I'd love to see what the AI thinks of it. If it creates derivative works and better user experience, more content, if it's on point, I'd be curious. I don't give a shit if it's AI or not. Do you? If it no. sucks, then we take no, it down. I, it's <laughs> useful, right? Well, I mean, that's that's another great way to use AI is to summarize news, right? So you don't have to read the whole thing. Give me the key points. It's like cliff notes. All right, Dave, we got to get in the rant section as we wind down our episode 14. Well. What's your rant for the week? Well, the, the House passed, you know, they came to an agreement with the White House, with the president to deal with the debt ceiling. I guess my... My rant is, it's not dealing with the debt, right? All it's doing is raising the ceiling. And I think I'd like to see them either either raise the debt or just stop with the madness. Just maybe, maybe change the law so you don't even have to go through this anymore. But I think, you know, I've been of the thought, John, that we actually have to deal with entitlements. Um, and we have to deal with defense. And you see, as part of this deal, they're going to cut nickels and dimes here and there. And of course, we're talking billions, tens of billions, hundreds of billions, but it's still in the grand scheme of things, nickels and dimes. Um, but defense up 3%, okay? Because that's politically, you know, sui political suicide to cut defense. And they're not going to touch any entitlements, i.e. Social Security and Medicare. Those can't touch because people have earned those. And the fact is, unless you deal with those, you're never going to deal with the debt. So I think they've got to find another way, right? And I think it's maybe, you know, recapitalizing, you know, the, the, the debt portfolio and figuring out how to take a longer term view. Uh, but I just don't see a day. I mean, they talk about the debt ceiling, but it has nothing to do with the debt. And it's really not doing much for the, for the deficit. So I guess that's kind of my mini rant. I think I'm almost... I'm kind of giving up on the government's ability to attack this problem. The last president to, to attack it was Clinton. Whether they're Republicans or Democrats, they don't seem to care anymore. So, you know, at some point, it's got to give, you know. I think smart people like Warren Buffett, I do, I don't pay attention to what he says about crypto, but I do pay attention to what he says, like about, it, that's why. says about this, but he just, I don't <laughs> think he understands it. You know? But so, not that I'm an expert at it, but I think there's some merit to the whole concept. Um, especially when the government's just printing, printing paper like this. So um, I kind of given up. I think that we've got to find another way or just resign ourselves to the fact that at some point it might just all blow up. And so damn the torpedoes, just keep yeah. printing money. Well, I mean, I think there's going to be a revolution. You know, my rant on that, it's not my rant for the week, but I'll just double down on my previous rants. I think we need new leadership and the younger generation needs to step up um, and lead. I'm happy to, to be involved. But that, you know, we could be, we need, we need someone in their 20s. If I was 25 again, which I want to be, I wish I was 25 again, I'd be out there. I mean, I think you can do more now. It seems with the productivity and technology, that's not, it's not just a tech industry more. Tech is everything. Tech is involved in all of our fabric of life. And it's going to be viewed that way. And, and the nerd should have a lot of power. The tech leaders should have a lot of power. And the companies should have a lot of power. And they should bring that power to government to reset and refactor government and how it works. Because the government's supposed to serve the citizens to provide liberty and freedom. Now, liberty and freedom is not a surveillance culture. 
So I guess I'm going on a rant here, but do you want to live in a surveillance society or a free society with liberty? Well, if you want a surveillance culture, that's China. That's okay too. If you want that, you got you got to be China. You got to beat them at their own game. A lot of surveillance going on in our country. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well, people don't want. Some people want liberty and freedom, which means you're in your own house. You can say whatever you want. Well, or you know, pursue your dreams without any government intervention. I mean, we're living in a society that's borderlining where you could say something that might be controversial, and you're going to get canceled. And there's a lot of backlash around this new culture of not opening up free ideas and free form communication. So freedom of speech is, people use it as a punchline, but ultimately there should be civil discourse and people should be able to talk. And without fear of doing that, when, when they say, oh, don't worry about it, you're not going to get uh, punished, they still don't do it. And my rant is going to be on this. Sound like Elon, free speech. Well, I think every American would say, do you don't want free speech? I, I'm, do you want I'm liberty and free freedom? Speech. Yeah, the am, Constitution is what the country's all about. But think, it's got to evolve. I mean, evolution is like, let's change the things. Like make it, make it work, you know? Assault weapons, rifles, you don't need AR guns. Come on, get rid of those immediately. Anyway. I don't Actually, want we, we, somebody on our team has an AR. Right. I mean, if you like to shoot, get an AR range and go rent. I was, I was don't surprised. Don't walk around with it. Explain to me. No, it's like, you know, we keep it locked, locked up. And we're yeah, very sure. careful with it. Right but, until someone gets the key, uh, and then boom. But anyway, my rant is on this Amazon story. I said I was mentioning it earlier about this Amazon workers walk out amid layoffs, citing concerns with the climate. It wasn't the climate that was a red herring, but the word Amazon's climate employees for climate justice. You know. Amazon does a lot for the, for, for the country, and they do a lot for the carbon footprint. They do a lot of work on that. But the, uh, this is concerning how low morale is, said the Seattle-based employee, who walked out and spoke on the condition of, of anonymity because of fear of retali- retaliation. A lot Free of, speech. Okay. <laughs> Washington Post, not, re- not putting down their sources. Uh, well, you know, like, again, someone close to the situation. It, you know, it's just, I don't know how this What's your issue? Seen. What's your issue with that? One is there's no quotes for any employees. One, there's no, they're hiding behind a, a, ter, a, a firm, some probably astroturf from Amazon employees for climate justice. This was on Bezos' publication that this came out? Yeah, this is this is Washington Post. Democracy dies in darkness. So, you know, let me see if they do a disclosure on this thing. So, yeah, they do. Amazon's founder and former chief of Jeff owns the Washington Post. They have to put that at the end. Um, yeah, Amazon's under a lot of heat, right? But but you know, why why the walkout? Because you're not going to go. You got to go to work three days a week. You know, Jassy's on the record. I interviewed him during the pandemic. I asked him the direct question: Do you prefer virtual or in person or hybrid? And he said, for certain jobs, being in the office, riffing on the whiteboard—that's where the, some of the best ideas came from. And that you just can't do that remotely. I agree with him on that. I think that's true. For certain jobs, being in a group environment, dynamic. There's all kinds of verbal, nonverbal action, brainstorming, uh, iterations that go on when you're on a whiteboard or having dinner or you're ideating over on a project. If you're a builder, that's what you do. That's where inspiration comes from and teamwork. So I'm for that. I think some jobs can be done remotely. But some of the most progressive companies on this topic, I could think of two offhand, Dell and Snowflake. Snowflake actually moved its headquarters to Bozeman, Montana. And and Sloopman and Scarpelli live out there. How are they doing right now? They're doing great. Okay. So, and then Dell has basically said. That's not what I said on LinkedIn yesterday until I changed it. What are you talking about? I had to change my link. We'll come to that in a second. So anyway, and so Dell, I was been very open to people working remotely. That said, both companies are basically saying, hey, we have a back to work framework. I think Dell's was something like if you're within an hour of of an office, you know, you got to be in a couple times a week. I always call it Taco Tuesday, right? The company provides some incentives for people to come in. I don't think that's unreasonable two to three days a week to ask people to come into the office if they're within some kind of reasonable radius. You know, I get it. If I mean, you, you live in, what's the traffic like in California these days? I mean, it's, it's getting worse. People are yeah, going back to the office. When I was out there in Boston, it's terrible. Boston's terrible yeah. too. Well, that's so, because the streets and our parking. So I get they put the know, bike lanes in in but, Boston. That was. I, but I get people not wanting to commute. You know, an hour and a half each way, or even an hour each way, starts to get tough. I mean, so I, I get that, and it's frustrating, and you waste a lot of time, and it's and it's you know you lose some productivity. But I don't think it's unreasonable to say, hey, a couple times a week, you got to be in the office, or you know, once once a month, you got to be in the office three or four days a week. 
you know, and let's pick those times. I think it's a reasonable request slash demand. So, I well, know. I kind of agree. What's our policy? We've well, been kind of loosey goosey. I want to ask right? ChatGPT to put a policy together. No, but I mean, generally speaking, we've had we've tried to put some. We've tried to entice people to come in. Well, we we have a work know. at home policy. We don't have a formal policy. No, but, but people have, come into the office in yeah, our company. Yeah, for of course, the most they part, do. Unless they work. You oh, know. they're they're there mostly every day, right. like five days a week. But you know, I think I think Monday and Friday, and then three days a week is beautiful. I think that's a great benefit. Um, and if some people can do the jobs remotely. I mean, if you're a blogger, you're a re reporter, you're in the plane most, you can be at home, no big deal. There's no cre the creative jobs are really the key and the teamwork with this camaraderie involved, I think it's important. And if you're going to do virtual like HashiCorp or, or um, companies like Snowflake, they have to provide a mechanism for group face-to-face. -face. I think if you're going to do virtual only, virtual first companies, which there are, there's proven ways to do it, you got to have a face-to-face -face company meeting you know, get together. And then at some point it becomes so big, maybe you can do it differently. But that's, that's my rant. This whole climate change, you know, justice warrior kind of thing. It just seems sounds fake. Like a ruse. It seems fake, sounds fake to me. Doesn't sound real. Doesn't sound legit. Um, and so I, that, that doesn't pass the stink test at all. Well, Dave, we got a lot of, a lot of cube coming up. We got a massive calendar coming up in this month, June. We got a couple of weeks off in July. We've got SuperCloud coming up June 7th, 18th. And let me tell you, SuperCloud is getting a lot of traction. I think the and now that the RSA kind of bloom is off the rose, we got action happening. We're going to be at Cisco Live in Vegas next week. This AWS London Summit. We're going to cover some exclusive news from AWS. It's going to hit on the 7th. Hence my Matt Garman interview today. Next week, Reinforce is Anaheim, which is Amazon security event. That's one or two days. I might, I might pop in for only one. I got some other things going on. And then you got um, HPE Discover, MongoDB in New York, um, and just Google Next is coming up, VMware Explorer, SuperCloud. <laughs> oh my God, Dave, it's going to be crazy. I know, and then, right, and then, yeah, Google Cloud Next is going to be great. I mean, we got to, we're got back at Google Cloud. Yeah. Excited about that. Yeah, and anyone watching out there right now, we're covering startups in the AI area, very hot, cloud, next-gen cloud, edge. Open source, these are our primary areas. We've got some great stories, or you're launching, let me know. We'll get a video feature on you. We love to get that AI news. There's tons of startups emerging. If you have any questions, DM us. Go to siliconangle.com. That's where all the traffic is. That's where all of our content is. You want to find out about what's going on, go there. Cube.net is where we, we can find out where the Cube is, what events are happening, past events, future events, what's playing. That'll all end up on siliconangle.com. That's the main site. And I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante, episode 14. Thanks for watching. Of course, give us feedback. We're going to have some special guests come in. We hit 20 episodes. We're going to get our groove. Let us know how we're doing. We'll see you next time.